afternoon, January the 20th, 2015. This is CISG 114, Section 1, Web Technology and Light. Today is day number five into the third week of the semester. So let's get started. First of all, welcome back. Uh, we have a very good class, very good science. We're four persons. That means two peers, one team. This semester is an excellent time for us to conduct conversations. I you look at the teacher's message I released yesterday, okay, and I talk about the importance of coming back to understand the GE program intended learning outcome, which I already explained to you on last class, and then the three important course learning objectives, which I have been doing in every class, and hopefully you can follow the specific suggestions in order for you to achieve the following course intended learning outcomes. So in this course, we have possibly four. We are going to achieve out of six, okay? So, um, and after that, I would like you to make sure that you give me your learning partner's name, which is a four person, so you can easily talk with your buddies here to see who's going to be the learning partner for whom. Uh, hopefully, before the end of today, you can leave me a message in Dr. Matt's Q&A hotline for this week, week number three, uh, who is going to be your learning partner? And then you need to prepare one page resume, a CV of yourself, which include where you come from, which high school you're from, in the high school, what's your strength, how many courses you've taken in the high school, that means the subjects. And um, you also give me an estimate of your standing in your class and some of your expertise. So if you're a member of the Drama Cup, you can blame that. If you're a member of the uh, Music Sense Cup, you can also do it. Um, one page, not more than one page, one A4 page, okay, that is very important. And then uh, I'm going to give you uh, the status of a pair and you can start using the pair discussion forum installed in, in the Moodle environment uh, since the beginning of this week. But if you do not have a learning partner, you may not be able to use them because I've not installed you in the group. So before the end of today, please let me know through Dr. Vets Q&A hotline, uh, your learning partner. You can send me an email, but the best is to leave me a message in Dr. Vets Q&A hotline for this week. And then make sure you feel comfortable with these five important steps of learning. Uh, first of all, you need to do some reading, uh, be it watch a particular soft video. Then you need to do thinking, okay? In order to do some analysis, read to understand something, Think to do some analysis and then reason is trying to put things together to learn how to apply what you've learned and then share that winning feeling with your learning partner and then write something expressively into a blog, into a report. And that is what you're going to do repeatedly throughout the semester uh, in order to be developed in each one of you the ability to learn to learn, okay? And you can also visit the before class link, during class link, after class link, and end up with link. These are specific suggestions of how you can keep track of your learning throughout the semester. Okay, and that's a very simple message, reinforcing what I told you in class, but making sure that I put it down black and white so that you know how to refer back to it. That is the course intended learning outcomes, very important that you need to start accumulating evidence of the learning in the context of homework, the artifacts of your learning contracts, okay? So let's go back to this week. Now this week, this is week number three, um, we are still in the learning contract number one and we are practicing inquiry-based learning, but when you look at the topics, we're going into module number two, talk something about ethics, and social responsibility and module number three, the digital divide. And today we are going to have something in module two. And on Friday, we go to the digital divide. But in the meantime, we also would like to come back to a little bit on uh, the study you did on week number two, uh, specifically on the digital nations. I thank you very much. Uh, most of you have already done the questions I mentioned uh, by watching this particular documentary. And there are altogether nine chapters there, remember. And what I suggest you to do at the end of last class is you come up with at least three questions after watching each chapter. So if you have done already 
watching the night chapters, you should come up with 27 questions. 27 questions. And, and you know that uh, if, if you visit the Public on Night Discussions link here, we got already a lot of companies here who done uh, the questionings, okay? So we got a lot of questions already coming up here. Uh, excellent work. Um, uh, I have to comment on Jack's initiative, and then some of you have already followed up with that. Make sure you continue with that excellent effort. Okay, now without much ado, let me introduce you to the topics of this week, and particularly module number two, before we come back to watch the remaining of those donations towards the end of today. Now, um, get ready for this very important context of ethics. Let me show you uh, a very typical video, okay? Ethics. Are you going to upload that photo to the internet? Sure, sure. You don't mind people seeing me like that? Do you think I'm, I'm stupid? My pictures can only be seen by my friends on Fiesti. How many friends do you have on Fiesti? 175. Are there other people in the photo okay with the picture being uploaded? Well, if just my buddies can see it, there's no problem. Besides, it was a party. If they let somebody take their picture, it can't be that big a deal. If you get your picture taken, it's to show it off, right? Okay, but how well do you really know all of your online friends? How do you know you can trust them? Well, I don't know all of them. Some are good friends, others are acquaintances. But I decide who makes the list. Right, but any of those 175 people can copy your picture with a single keystroke and then do whatever they want to do with it. Mm, well, yeah, uh, I guess so. But what would they do that for? And if those friends share your picture with other people? No, nah, they wouldn't do that. Have you asked them not to? Do they know that you don't want other people to see that picture? They might think it's just a perfectly normal picture and that you don't care who sees it. Well, since you put it like that... But look, you, you're driving me crazy. You're paranoid. I've already configured my privacy settings, and that's enough. What more do you want? And if someone sneaks into your private zone? Impossible. They need to steal my password. But I haven't given it to anybody, and I've made it difficult to guess. Just in case. Besides, I update my antivirus software all the time to make sure Trojans that can steal them won't get through. You're talking to a pro. And the other 175? Are they also pros? They also do all those steps to make sure their information is secure. No, but... Your private space that no one can get into doesn't really sound that secure, does it? In social networks, 
Your online privacy can be affected by others. The privacy of others also depends on you. social networking account such as Facebook or QQ? Do you post photos online? When you post photos online, are those photos good enough that you do not need to ask for the permissions of any persons inside? Do you take photos of any persons and then put that person's photos online? Or you just take a good picture of this camper that's beautiful and I put the beautiful picture of this campus online without involving any specific persons of big head or whatever. Okay, now that is another issue, but in the specific case demonstrate here, what is so not quite appropriate in the picture? What is so not quite appropriate in the picture? They took some picture, for example, in a celebrations party, what I could see is three kids pulling down their pants and they took the picture with their underwear on which is not so polite and then the kid said uh, he's going to post it online to share that with his friends and then perhaps his mother said are you sure you wouldn't want to post pictures of this kind? now you do not mind that okay now the next question have you ever asked two other kids there? Would they mind you posting the pictures like this? But remember, the intellect wants to post something there and it's there forever. Okay? You cannot control it. You thought you'd take it down, but it's already there. So what is meant by ethics? Personally speaking, the ethical context involved here is the issues of privacy. This is my I really do not want anyone to take my private picture and sew it there because once it's there, I have to explain a lot and sometimes I will lose a job because of that. Well, to tell you a story, if you ever go to an interview and when the moment you submit your resume, um, mostly a lot of company today will do what we call an online checking of your profile to see if you have done anything uh, online which is not going to be appropriate. And they would like to clear you before they come to have an interview with you. And a lot of time, they discover some picture of wording that 
you have to laugh on some kind of a statue problem or picture in your Julia when you're doing something which is very clear. It's not appropriate. They will question you. Okay? Uh, and you have to justify why you do something like this. And that is a very important uh, step that you and each one of us need to be very careful when we post something online in a public arena. And when we talk about ethics here, we're talking about it's inappropriate for us to do something like this when what I'm doing is going to be affecting a lot of others or what others are doing is going to affect my personal life or not in the context of online privacy here. This is the people, okay? What you do here to learn what is meant by privacy is something a person who might keep them himself or herself we should not temper anything to disclose that person's information without an explicit permission of a particular person. And that's why in Macau, we have an office here under the SAR government, which is directly under the chief executive, which talked about the office of the um, personal privacy. Right? That's very good. Okay, that's uh, the first one. The second thing I would like to see if you would, would be interested in here is the ethics of intellect. Privacy. So here we are. Let's explore this issue a little bit further.
interesting. Responsibility is the sense of uh, uh, the sense produced by persons to be liable for what he or she is doing. Okay, so if I am uh, a responsible person as a teacher, I know that I need to come to class and give what you need in the context of learning. As a student, you need to be able to come to class to get what you need in the context of learning. And then at the end of the class, you need to fulfill the requirements on the part of the teacher. Get ready the next class have a part of student, finish what you're supposed to do, make sure learning activity is completed. This is an instance of personal responsibility to ensure that learning happens. Now in the context of social responsibility, that in this it's more um, between the two persons rather than only the persons alone. I'll give you an example. If you happen to work with a group where the group succeeds as a whole or the group fails as a whole, so each person in a group needs to fulfill his or her personal responsibility, and by doing that, you are actually upholding the context of social responsibility. You want the whole group to succeed, you do not want the group to fail, so each person in the group needs to fulfill his or her own obligations. That is an instance of social responsibility. In the neighborhood, if each household is going to uphold the context of social responsibility, each household has the responsibility to keep clean the environment. No single household will do such thing as throw the trust outside the door of his or her household without any regard of its labors. That is social responsibility. By individual, by individual household, but in the context of corporate social responsibility, is social responsibility performed by companies. Okay? Individual companies or what we call its um, units of the society, which forms the fragments of the society. So in Macau, we have a company called STDM, which is a very famous company, uh, established since the early 60s. And one of the major business of the company is gambling. Okay? It has uh, usurped the, the gambling monopoly in Macau for more than 40 years until 2002, when the Macau government after it's being returned to China, they decided to open up the gambling prisons. And so, uh, we have more than one, uh, what we call corporates, engaged in, in the casino business. Well, STDM is a company who's responsible for creating a clear path for the jet ferry, for the ferry to go uh, uh, from Macau to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Macau. Now, without a very effort produced by this company, almost on a daily basis, no 
no jet point to enter the harbors in Macau because the water there, uh, or the depth of the water there, is not sufficient for those jet points to both come into it. And so they have to dredge us every day. They have more than 40 ships, big and small. Every day they need to go along the path of the jet points um, navigation to make sure all the mud inside of the seabed is dragged in such a way that a deeper path could be created along the seaway that the jet boy could travel. Now this is an example of performing social responsibility for the people of Macau, for the community of Macau, and also for the development of Macau, because if that is not done, no jet boy could continue to come, come back to Macau uh, to, to, to the harbor. You might have to get off in the middle of the sea with a small boat and come in. Okay? So that is an example of corporate social responsibility. But when we talk about corporate social responsibility today, the content is even more than an individual service produced by a specific company in return of the uh, part of the privilege to operate this kind of business in the car. So what is corporate social responsibility? Now, the key is it contains something on sustainable development of a particular region. So, are you ready? Make sure you understand that. Let's learn something. Corporate social responsibility. Are you familiar with the term corporate social responsibility? It all started back in the 70s. The Club of Rome, a group of scholars, thinkers, executives, economists, and others who took on the task of laying out the future of industrial growth invented the concept of sustainable development. Ah, sustainable development. Does that ring a bell? At a time when resources are becoming more scarce and the population is growing, the challenge now facing people, governments, and businesses, all of us in fact, is to find the most sustainable forms of growth possible. And today, the trend is unstoppable. 1972, the Stockholm Earth Summit set out a wide-ranging plan for international action to fight pollution. Twenty years later, the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit defined economic progress, social justice, and environmental protection as the three pillars of regional sustainable development. The basis for action by the business world in support of local communities was established. And all over the world, Businesses have opened their doors to partnerships with local residents. They are investing money and taking initiatives in conducting and coordinating community support programs in the field and becoming a trusted partner in the process. Such businesses have put social responsibility at the heart of their strategy. Today, every company is asking itself, what practical steps can we take to improve the day-to-day -day lives of local residents? From a social standpoint, the company can work in each community to address local aspirations, assist with training, create local jobs, and give support to associations that are working towards the public good. In terms of economic development, the company can help develop a local skills network. By making its expertise or training resources available to local businesses, it can create a win-win strategy that promotes the local economy and yields access to valuable expertise. Finally, with regard to the environment, its task is to ensure that, as often as possible, its business activities take into account the need to protect and enhance local ecosystems. In addition to reducing its air, water, and soil emissions, the company can work with its employees to set up volunteer activities, or take action to clean rivers, transform vacant lots into vegetable gardens, encourage reforestation, and teach school children about recycling. There is no limit to the steps that can be taken. With Alstom, local communities can count on CSR every step of the way. Take South Africa, for instance, where Alstom has been operating for over a century. This immense country has a truly critical need for economic and social development. Education is moving forwards with Alstom. In South Africa, access to knowledge is key to development. For Alstom, helping people broaden their knowledge means, on a daily level, providing access to vocational training, offering internships, career development programs, creating an academic chair in clean energy, granting scholarships, and more. 
but it also takes the form of a partnership with a math center, an organization that works to improve conditions for maths and science education in schools. Economic development is always a priority with Alstom. In South Africa, Alstom is strengthening local industry by helping to improve the skills of craftsmen and engineers in the energy sector. To date, 650 craftsmen and 175 engineers and technicians have received training. The result is that a new network of qualified subcontractors is emerging, able to meet Alstom's needs and those of the energy sector as a whole. And finally, with Alstom, the world has a partner in preserving the environment. Alstom is conducting projects in South Africa that are educating and training communities in ways that preserve their natural heritage. These projects include the development of environment classes. When children learn how to create a vegetable patch, recover waste, collect rainwater and so on, the school becomes a means of conveying how important the environment is for their living conditions and helps students carry that message to the rest of their family. These and many other initiatives are encouraged by proactive laws passed by local authorities. Through its actions, Alston aims to contribute to social progress and environmental preservation by providing technological solutions that meet energy and transport needs. The group is assuming its responsibility with regard to its neighbors in the community. So you just have done material on a story that is it's a set story of a company called Astrum in Africa. Okay? So um, now I would like you to put some thinking into it. We'll put social responsibility. The thinking is very important. Um, we are talking about corporate social responsibility. I've given you an example before you watch the video. I've given you an example from the local companies in town. And then after you watch the video, particularly along the theme of sustainable not just operate in the regions in order to earn money. Okay? The company understands in order to sustain the revenue generations of a particular region, it has a peculiar role in corporate social responsibility. And what does Astro do, basically, and look into what they could do to improve the living of people on their particular regions by bringing up not just the economic role, but the quality of living in the context of education, in the context of creating jobs, in the context of improving the environment, uh, in many different contexts. Now, may I just put this challenge to each one of you? We have four persons here, and maybe two of you from Macau and two of you from mainland China. And use your own hometown as an example. And you know something about your hometown, you know some business people are doing the business there. And what can you think of, okay, for those business operating in your hometown to do a much better job than just earning what they earn in the context of corporate social responsibility? Think a little bit about, suppose you are the person who's going to change a little bit your hometown for a little bit better. doing something similar to this, what can you suggest? In the process of thinking, you need to identify what CSR is meant for that company, and what CSR is meant for your own time. And let me give you this challenge. Uh, we have, uh, I'll give you 10 minutes time uh, to think, and then I'll see if you can come into some kind of discussion with another five minutes, so it's a 15 minutes exercise, okay? So you can, you can write something on a piece of paper, you can start talking with your member, but it's very important that each one of you do this exercise on your own. The scenario is very simple. You study something about CSR, you are put in a position to explore the possibility of CSR in your own time, starting from thinking what kind of business your own time is processed, and then what can they do better with your suggestions. Okay? It's very important. So in the meantime, let me finish the attendance for the day. It's your free time.
10 minutes on your own, five minutes on discussions. On, if you want to do discussions now, go ahead. It's all right, all right? You must do some exercise. Do you understand? Ready to talk? We need to put things in perspective. So we invite you to, to think a little bit more on this video. It's important that my students get themselves engaged in the thinking um, in terms of what they can do in in corporate social responsibility for the hometown. So let's see what they come up. Yes, feel free to talk to your neighbors. Uh, it's very important that you exchange some of your ideas. So you got some ideas. What do you think uh, corporate social responsibility could do for your whole time? If you have a chance to introduce CSR into the companies operating in your whole time, what they could do according to your suggestions. Jack, could you share with us some of your ideas? Thank you. 
understand you correctly, you're suggesting that the business involved in your home farm is the uh, transportation business, taxi particularly, right? And you would like to suggest that if they could do uh, some corporate social responsibility, what if they could, say, offer the elderly people uh, a free ride, okay? So by offering to elderly people a free ride, uh, they could do something good. But the idea is, but there is nothing free of charge, right? So if you say we're going to offer the elderly a free ride, that means the elderly do not have to pay for the taxi, but someone is going to pay for the taxi because they need to offer the business because the person is doing the taxi is someone who needs to earn a living to. So the question is, if you would like to say, uh, let's think about our corporate social responsibility in this hometown to offer free ride taxi service to the elderly people. So let's say elderly people with a specific permit does, do not have to pay for any taxi charge. But it does not mean that the person driving the taxi who's making a living with taxi does has to do it free of charge because he has to he has to use that as the, to make his or her living. So we need to think about another way to compensate the taxi driver or the taxi company for every free ride they offer, okay? Now let me give you an example of Hong Kong. In a very poor region in Hong Kong, they call it Sam Sui Kong, okay? It's an old region with a lot of the old housing and with a lot of the people living below poverty line. And so a lot of people don't have anything to eat, okay? But they need to live. If they don't eat, they're going to die. Uh, in Hong Kong, in particular in Sam Sui Po, there are several traditional Chinese style restaurants. We, in Chinese, we call it Silak Di. There they, they have the roasted pork, the roasted chicken, the roasted duck. Okay? Or better say, the little restaurant. Uh, one of the owners of this restaurant has a very kind heart. He can see a lot of poor people there. So he set up his own business to. Uh, to operate in two different particular um, directions, one direction. His food is going to be excellent, but people do not need to pay a high price. The other kind of service is if you're poor enough, as long as you got a charity, you'll take it, okay? You can come here and eat your lunch of meal without charge. But how can the poor people know where they got the ticket, okay? So, he did something like this. He trusts everyone. If you're really poor, you're hungry, you come here and eat. Someone will pay for your lunch in my restaurant. You don't need to worry about the money. You just need to come to eat. So the next time, if you need to eat again, come, but I give you a ticket. Okay? He will give the poor person a ticket. Then he will tell the person where he could get those tickets. Okay? Now, he is operating a small restaurant. Someone has paid the price of the individual meal. So if I'm here to eat a lunch, it will cost about $25. Someone will say, today I'm going to sponsor you, say, $2,500. And $2,500 divided by 25, what do you get? 100 100 lunch is going to be offered free of charge today for this week. So as long as there's someone who comes up here and say, I have a need, I don't have money, you just let them eat. Feed them, okay? No question asked. Give them the best respect, just like any other customer, okay? So, but who is going to pay? Corporate social responsibility in Hong Kong has done something very good. A lot of the uh, big restaurants and a lot of the people, even you and I can do it, we just go to that restaurant, we eat our lunch and meal there, we pay our price. And then, if my price is $25, I will just lay, lay down $25 plus. I have $500 here, you take it. So you divide the $500 with the meal, how much uh, you can share with how many people you design. Okay? And you don't need to give me any particular receipt. A lot of people understand this company will operate this way. 
and each day that particular um, there is a list of number of meals offered today which is free of charge in front of the restaurant store so if they have 100 meals they will type 100 there and if you're hungry if you have no money just walk in pay with your kids and eat I'm sorry you just eat for you and they say no sorry someone's paid for you already so just come and eat and they have been operating this for more than five years and I can show you the TV documentaries on this very interesting restaurant. Now let's take a talk, return to your business. So someone is going to pay for the taxi fare for the elderly. Well, who's going to pay for that? Well, if this is good enough, it could be led by some company. Then the company is saying, each month I'm going to sponsor uh, the taxi fare for 10 elderly people. Okay, no matter how far they, they travel, you just bill me. Honest people will do honest work, okay? And because we always have a taxi driver, we have uh, receive a ticket and the auto vehicle will keep track of things like this, okay? So this company will meet the charge of, to do something like that. And this company is going to introduce the same kind of things to another company. They're operating locally and they are willing to do another tear. So this particular taxi driver could offer, because of the contributions of two different companies, Okay, just two now. Ten plus ten, free ride for elderly people. And a taxi driver could also earn his or her own living. Now, the system must be working in a much more um, check and balance manner to avoid taxi driver creating this kind of fear uh, with a lot of tricks. Okay, but that is another business. And so, what I mean is when you talk about corporate social responsibility. You don't just talk about doing something for nothing. We are talking about you can always do something good for different audience and you can always get something back from different people. And that is how the resources of society is going to run smoothly. But what's happening in China today is a lot of times we see a small number of people earning a lot of money without releasing the resources to other people who are living in need. So the rich get richer and the poor get poor. Because um, we do not see a lot of corporate social responsibility operating very easily here. But in the first time on call, uh, it's somehow in the country, we see that uh, a lot of the charity work works very well. Okay? But when we do not call this purely charity, we call this business talking business. You just operate as a business. But we have a mindset that different company supporting the initiative to sponsor this kind of things. So there's always kind of things working. And in order to organize better, uh, people who have a heart to help, uh, to help the society who set up something called the social enterprise. Uh, social enterprise with a lot of emphasis on CSR. The purpose of setting up a social enterprise is to ensure that different company will have a chance to join the CSR movement in particular regions and ensure that they have different services for the need. Okay? Now, this is an example of that. Let's see. Now, let's come back to a, a deeper ideas of corporate social responsibility. Ten minutes. Let's see if I uh, have a better understanding. layoffs and record profits at the same time, manager salaries, scarcity of natural resources, and imminent climate catastrophes, morally questionable advertising, child labor, corporate fraud, financial crisis, and the Occupy Wall Street movement. These are just a few examples you may have heard about under the topic of sustainability, business ethics, or corporate social responsibility. These themes raise questions about justice for current as well as for future generations.
want to ask Corporate Social Responsibility, CSR for short, what is this? This man made headlines a few years ago. In 2004, Angelo Ugolotti learned from investigators that he was chairman of the board of several companies set up by his employer, the Italian milk concern Pernalat. Angelo, however, had not even heard of those companies. At Parmalat, he was only responsible for the switchboard. <laughs> you can imagine how the story goes. Corporate fraud at its best. Bogus companies, cooking with books, bribery, accounts in the Cayman Islands. The whole works. The task of corporate social responsibility is to prevent these and other morally reprehensible practices which can weaken society, damage companies, and hurt employees. More and more companies have realized the relevance of moral practices in their businesses, even though they have not always sufficiently implemented CSR yet. Concrete preventative measures are often labeled risk management, a term more commonly used for avoiding financial risks and damage to a company's reputation. No one likes bad press, right? Thus, companies define clear rules, so-called compliance or value management systems. For example, you can accept a bottle of wine from the supplier, but you have to pass up a dolphin trip to Hawaii. However, risk and compliance management are only one aspect of corporate responsibility correctly understood. Firstly, CSR is not just about preventing bad practices, like corruption and fraud and so on. Secondly, this approach does not question a company's business activities as such. In fact, compliance management could be an efficient control mechanism even in organizations like the Mafia. The more challenging question is, how can companies contribute to a good society through good business practices? Oh, that's easy, they say. We'll create a charity foundation or donate a lot of money and thus do good. Wrong. That won't hurt and may even help, but it's not systemic change. The important thing is, CSR is about how companies make profits, not about how they spend them. Corporate social responsibility must not simply be the repair center of capitalism. It has to demand systemic change in a market economy. This requires a new role for the key players in this game. Companies must become not only economic, but also moral actors. What's required and important is a stronger integrative perspective based on a system of ontological values and which is closely related to the company's core business. This means social and ecological criteria must be taken into consideration. For example, in the treatment of employees, organization of the production process, offered and produced products and services, and responsible business practices of suppliers, the so-called supply chain. By the way, virtuous managers or the honorable merchant alone will not suffice. We need employees of integrity at all levels of the company, but we also need organizational structures and clear rules. But relying on a code of conduct is also short-sighted, because in extreme cases, it means act according to some given rules, which is the opposite of ethical reflection, namely actual thinking about good and evil. Right and wrong. In other words, CSR is always about both individuals and institutional structure. In business ethics, one speaks of individual ethics and institutional ethics. But isn't that unrealistic? Shouldn't the state do more to promote a good and fair society? Granted, it is unrealistic. And that's exactly why such questions are important. Business ethicists don't just ask what the world is like, but also what it should be like, how it ought to be. At the very least, we want to suggest where the journey should lead. At the same time, we want to make practical suggestions about how to embark on that journey. One speaks of questions of justification on the one hand and of implementation on the other, preferably in that order. The state, particularly through politics and law, can contribute to the implementation of corporate responsibility, but only within a limited range. If we look at society from a bird's eye view, we can spot different social systems. The economic system, the political system, the justice system, for example. One can speak of the functionally differentiated society we live in. About 60 or 70 years ago, 
some German economists came up with an idea that led to the development of the social market economy as we know it, particularly in Europe. The thought that a market economy should be embedded in a political framework that determines the rules of the game. This underlying idea is still important, but it has become distinctly more difficult to rely on the state alone. Societal differentiation has progressed because most systems have internationalized. Globalization is the magic word that applies to most systems, but not all of them. Politics, and particularly law, tend to be bound to one country's borders, while the economy, above all, is highly internationalized and globalized. This makes effective regulation difficult. Thus, it is now not only about the classic rules of the game, but also about the moves of the players, the corporations, in a changed and changing world. And beyond politics and law, civil society, in particular NGOs, have gained a strong influence on the economy, as both vicious watchdogs and as partners of business. In the society of the 21st century, we find new, rather odd, hybrid constructs under the notion of soft laws. These are collective individual commitments to comply with certain social and ecological standards, such as collective industry agreements or the UN Global Compact. So companies are supposed to operate responsibly. Is anything really happening? There is no clear answer to that question. The cynics say that CSR is like teenage sex. Everybody says they are doing it, but few actually are. And those who really do it, do it rather badly. The truth is more nuanced, of course. In the area of corporate responsibility, there is also the good, and the bad, and the really ugly. More and more companies deal with CSR and take the first steps towards responsible business practices. We can definitely observe a distinct effort, even though it is still a delicate little plant. And of course, there are still those who misconstrue CSR as a PR instrument and simply want to greenwash or bluewash their company. And unfortunately, there are still companies that don't give a damn about questions of corporate responsibility and which even trample on justice. Got all that? Let's sum it up. First, CSR stands for Corporate Social Responsibility. Second, CSR is based on the question of good business for a good society, today and tomorrow. Third, corporate social responsibility is not charity. It is about how companies earn their profits, not how they spend them. Fourth, it takes employees of integrity and appropriate organizational structures to realize CSR. It is a matter of individual and institutional ethics. Fifth, politics continue to play an important role. But in a globalized world, the effects of regulation can be limited. And thus, sixth, companies play an increasingly important role. Seventh, soft laws are new governance mechanisms based on companies' self-commitment. Finally, CSR has arrived in business practice. It is necessary to support these developments professionally, but also to provide critical perspectives with respect to them. Research on issues of corporate responsibility is still beginning, and future developments will be exciting to see. It is unclear whether a good and fair society can be created with the help of companies, but it can be created without them. forgot. Besides corporate responsibility, there is also consumer responsibility. You can practice that the next time you go shopping. And there may be more from us on that topic. It's an excellent video produced by this professor's present cabinet. It puts into perspective a lot of the interesting challenging practices and concept of corporate social responsibility. And when you read the conclusions of the video, it's given you a very concise context of this. And the question is, well, corporate social responsibility is good business for a good society. And it's not charity. It is going to be something sustainable for that particular regions. And it must be done 
from the heart for the common good. Okay? And what can we do to induce that? Well, in the context of Macau, you can see that the reasons why the gambling business in Macau is open up to different players around the world is because the government has some expectations on those players. So once they earn the money here, they need to return something to the society. Well, although it has not been done very for me effectively, because what they believe they have to return is in terms of taxations. That they earn, say, one million dollars, they give fourteen percent of that one million dollar back to the government. That's it. That is a very much business to do. That has not actually implemented the CSR concepts yet. So what the Macau government needs to do, if they want to enforce uh, the practice of CSR. To society. Everybody knows that the, the gambling is the only business in Macau that makes it flowers today. And what the central government and, and also the Macau government, when I can see it, we want something much more diversified. Right? And how can you do something much more diversified? Well, you can think about how to regulate those companies operating the gambling business along the CSR line. What they should do to education, what they should do to pensions here to the, the benefits of people here, uh, the health care perhaps, uh, and, and then the cognitive line. That, that one of the very famous things that the government has been doing for each permanent, non-permanent resident here is to pay the money every year. Uh, you can start with 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 is the end. But it, it, does it, is it all? No. Because a lot of people living here understand that it's very hard in the middle of town compared to 15 years ago. So the corporate social responsibility for a lot of the company maybe is to provide quarters for the employees, for the families, right? Uh, uh, maybe to provide special uh, package of blessings for the development of the family, the education of the kid. Um, if you have uh, babies, you need to go to the nursing home during the day so that the parents do the work better. So what if you think about these things? So I think um, it, it's, it's quite enough for you to understand this more in the context of ethics, uh, in the um, intellect era for intellect privacy, and then for the CSR concept. And on the first day, we would like to come back to the digital divide concept. Okay. So before I let you go, uh, I want you to uh, review uh, the Digital Nations chapter, I think this time is chapter four. It's just a couple more minutes, okay? To ensure that you have uh, something going on in your brain after you've done some questions there, okay? Um, I try to do it this chapter by chapter to make sure it's easy for you to understand. So I guess it's About 90% of Korean children use the internet in their daily life. Of those, about 10 to 15% are in the high risk group. Remember the very famous story in South Korea. What's now a public health crisis began with the best of intentions. Ten years ago, this country emerged from economic crisis by refashioning its culture and commerce around digital technology. Its embrace of the online world was broad and deep, and it's not altogether surprising that South Korea has become one of the first countries to confront the fallout of the digital revolution. We met 15-year-old Chung Young il in the city south of Seoul. It's pretty extreme. I play seven or eight hours a day. Then on weekends, I stay up all night on the computer. When Young il starts a game, he doesn't know when to stop, and he just plays for hours. 
Over the last year, Yogil has dropped from the top half of his class to the bottom. His mother thinks it's because of the computer. I'm not sure, but I think he mostly uses the computer to play some type of fighting game. I wish those games didn't exist. That inability to communicate with me, his own mother, makes me so sad. I think if I can't control him right now, I may lose my son. This is an addiction. Only an addict could act this way. In an effort to help kids like Yongyo, the Korean government has opened free internet rescue camps throughout the country. At the recommendation of a teacher, Yugiel's mother will be leaving him here for two weeks. The day starts with a group counseling session. Most of the kids here say they've had to seek medical treatment for conditions that resulted from overusing the computer, like eye strain and ear complications. The kids' treatment regimen, surprisingly low tech, seemed designed mainly to recapture a childhood lost to the computer. When you go home, will you start using the computer again? Or will it be different? Honestly, I don't expect a lot. Not using the computer for 10 days was hard. I just kept thinking about the games. More about getting out of the camp and going home. My heart went out to these kids. Casualties of the digital revolution. For better and for worse, these people are connected and connecting through the technologies that I championed 20 years ago, when I first started writing and speaking about a future I called Siberia. The latest is called Siberia. Deborah Cox joined this morning in New York. Hello, Doug. All right, good to be here. In the early days of the internet, it was easy for me to reassure people about what it would mean to bring digital technology into their lives. Are folks getting a little afraid of the technology because it's going so quickly? Are we going to be left in the dust or can we keep up? Well, I think people get scared as things develop, especially when they... Back then, I was convinced the web could help us change in profoundly good ways, allowing us to evolve into better people. I can introduce you, Miss Tobin, to the new me human being. <laughs> it's a new human being that's, that's evolved, I think, to the next level, and I think it's... I think it's fascinating and wonderful to watch. I felt like I was in on a secret, that these old fuddy-duddies were just panicking, underestimating our kids' ability to adapt to the new reality before us. You're actually moving around the pixels yourself on the screen. Over the past 20 years, however, the net has changed from a thing one does to the way one lives, connected all the time. And it appears that far more of these kids than I would have thought are overwhelmed. The Korean government has taken an assertive approach to addressing the social problems caused by the net. At Korean elementary schools, kids are taught to go online around the same time they are taught to read. But they're also taught something else, how to use computers responsibly. 
it's required for Korean students starting in the second grade. At this school, signs preaching healthy internet habits line the hallways. And what's this one say? Slanderous comments on internet personal friends. And this one says, constantly playing computer games shrinks your capacity to think. Our ancestors were known as the politest Eastern state. Now, we are the kingdom of internet etiquette. When a child is just six years old, what's the most important things they need to learn about the internet? I think they must learn ethics first, internet etiquette and manners, and then learn the technical subject. Watching these kids, I'm skeptical that this top-down approach could ever work in America. I guess we'll have to find our own way. Watching my kids with the computer, I find myself wondering, how did they figure this out? Were these skills somehow handed out at birth? And could anything that seems so natural really be bad? Last fall, after a lot of careful... Now, remember, we stop here, now it's time, okay? There are a lot of meaningful discussions here also, but I would like you to pay attention to chapter 3. Because in chapter 3, we got a lot of very interesting discussions. For example, what do you mean by being an internet guardian angel? You know, the kids there in South Korea in the classroom, right? But when they're 6 years old, they start learning how to use computer. What did the teacher say? What they are going to learn? Well, what does it mean by ethics for six years old? That means teach them the do's and don'ts. Okay, the manners. They need to demonstrate in using the intellect. And all of a sudden, you see a duck rustle said, this kind of top down approach may not work in the United States, in the free countries. But it sounds to be working in South Korea. But I remember, I have kids also. And my kids start using computer in their, in the K3, I guess. And they, they know how to use computer very well. And I, I didn't hear them say that we need to learn ethics. Uh, except for the fact that when, when, they, when they come home with, it, with their USB finger, when I check it often, they already infect the virus every time they use it. Okay, now, my question is, each one of you should have come up with three essential questions for that chapter. Again, chapter number three. I would like you to come back here on the middle environment. Okay, this is the middle environment. Um, I think this one. Okay, if you come to the discussion forum here on week number two, you should be able to see some question posed on the explanation, for example, posed by Jack. And if you have not posed the questions on your own, please make sure you post the questions here or you follow up with Jack's questions, okay? You just here, come here. Okay, this is Jack's questions for the number of chapters here, okay? Now just look at chapter number three, okay? Now this is the three questions posed by Jack. I would like each one of you to respond to Jack's posting here and to respond by posting your three questions for chapter number three for me, okay? The chapter on South Korea's gaming crazy. Okay? And I would like to compare your questions. Can you do that? Jack, you do not need to do anything except that you may respond. Alice, Calvin, and Lucas. Okay? 
make sure you watch chapter three and pose three questions of your own. This is something very important. And may I remind, may I remind you, I hope that you can give me the information of the learning partner before the end of today by writing me a message here on document QA online the week number three. Okay? It's very simple. You just pick one. Okay? And then I'm going to install you in a book so that you can start using the peer on the discussion form. So before the end of today, each one of you leave me a message here, say my learning partner, and then type the information of your learning partner. Okay? The way to type it is very simple. Remember, under uh, week number two's message, okay, we have a table here, you can copy, okay? You just copy this table, paste it into Dr. Webb's Q&A hotline, and type in your name and your partner's name, student ID, and so forth, okay? Each one of you need to do something like this so that I can install you into the peer discussion forum. So I think that's it for today until this first day come back to the digital divide. And put a little bit more thinking in the conference also responsibility leader. It's going to be very useful. All right, I see you on first day. Thank you. See you, all right. So that's it for today's CISG 114, section one, web technology and light. On day number five, January the 9th at the 20th, 2015. Until this first day, Stay in tune.